Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network for short. Uh, the network is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org, and Nick Weiner from Open Channels is joining us today uh, to co-host this webinar. Uh, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Uh, we have Patrick Christ and Samantha Kocha of NatureServe, who are going to be speaking today about integrated land sea planning in Puerto Rico's Northeast Ecological Corridor. And uh, Patrick, in particular, is no stranger to these webinars as he uh, has been the uh, principal investigator for the EBM Tools Network for the past 10 years. Um, so before we get started and turn it over to Patrick and Samantha, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Uh, there's two ways to ask questions. You can um, you can type them into the question panel on the user interface, and that is the easiest and most surefire way um, to ask the question. Um, you can type your questions in at any point during the, the webinar. Uh, just quick clarifying questions. We may ask the speakers during their presentations, um, but uh, more substantive questions will hold till the end. Um, or you can raise your virtual hand. That's a little hand button in your the hand icon in the user interface, um, and then if we see your hand up, we will, uh, I'll probably ping you through the chat function, and uh, you'll see in the question panel and ask you if you really want to ask a question and um, verify that, and then I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly to Patrick and Samantha. Okay, well, great. Thank you guys so much for, for being here today to present, so I'll turn it over to you guys now. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Appreciate the opportunity to present again to the community. And uh, why don't we go ahead to the next slide. All right, well, just a quick overview of what we're going to be covering today. So uh, ILSP stands for Integrated Land Sea Planning. So we want to talk about the concept of that, some of the project objectives uh, for this study we're going to show and talk about our methods. We like to, in particular, since this is a tool demo, focus on the decision support toolkit the steps of the project and conclude with some live demonstration. Next. So let me just start off with a definition. This one comes from my colleague Jorge Alvarez Romero from James Cook University where they describe ILSP as integrated cross-realm planning and they say it's a process to guide the spatial allocation of management actions and land and water uses to achieve explicit environmental and socioeconomic objectives across terrestrial, freshwater, and marine realms. Next. So some key components of this is that we do want to address resource management needs in terrestrial, freshwater, and marine. We're not solely focused on marine. It addresses the stressors within and across the realms. And ideally, we want to move in both directions, meaning that we have direct stressors within the ocean and on the land. We also have land-based stressors that are migrating into the aquatic realm. And then we can also have sea level rise and storm surge originating, of course, in the sea and affecting our coastal resources. Next. And then we want to integrate cross-realm ecosystem processes, so these would be um, the actual beneficial aspects of, say, sediment and nutrient delivery. And then integrate the agencies, policies, and stakeholders across the realms, this being very important because these different realms, planning and management, uh, has tended to be and continues to be very stovepiped. And then we want to integrate these tools and these processes that we can reveal both co-benefits and trade-offs between planning actions um, on the land and in the water. And just an example of these trade-offs, for example, is the um, U.S. corn production in the Midwest drives a lot of nutrient delivery down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico, which creates a large dead zone and has some significant impacts on fisheries production. Next. So we um, studied uh, a lot of different frameworks, and we pulled together this one. I'm going to step through this um, in some detail. It's a bit complex, but uh, so is cross-realm planning. So uh, this bar across the top is really just representing the stakeholder processes involved, and we begin at the left with the scoping. Next. 
And uh, that entails all the usual scoping activities of um, identifying your resources and your stressors and defining desired future conditions and so on. Next. From there, we're going to generate a database of spatial and non-spatial information that can represent um, these different scoping factors. And we're going to select and populate tools that can uh, address our modeling and representation needs for resources, um, scenarios. This is a scenario-based framework. Um, and modeling. Next. From there, after we've characterized scenarios, we're going to evaluate our scenarios in terms of resource outcomes and socioeconomic outcomes. Part of this is going to include the cross-realm process modeling below. Next. We're going to take these results back to the stakeholders and review the results of the scenario evaluation. From there, we're going to identify key stressors and issues and identify um, trade-offs for resolution. Next. Part of the framework entails running optimizations that can generate spatial alternatives. And then from there to develop alternative futures that can mitigate stressors both currently and in the future scenarios and address those cross-realm processes. Next. Going back to the stakeholders, uh, there are some decisions to be made. And so that's going to entail selecting the preferred future that meets the cross-realm objectives. And of course, inherent in cross-realm is also cross-organization, uh, cross-community, uh, and so on uh, objectives. And then to develop an implementation plan from the preferred alternative. Next. That plan then goes into a phase of implementation and monitoring. And that monitoring results um, in the need to conduct adaptive management periodically, which takes us back to our scenario evaluation and cross-realm process modeling. Next. So to that framework, we can attach a specific software toolkit. Um, and I do want to just note uh, that comment on the bottom right is that the toolkit can be configured differently for different regions. They have different issues, project objectives, and also different capacity. Um, so we're going to start off with the core tools and then just keep in mind there's a lot of other tools or different configurations that can be made out of this. So we begin on the left with this common database. Um, that can also include tools that are web portals that we might draw data from. We have our VISTA software tool um, that's used to represent values um, and viability requirements of our targets, um, characterizing scenarios and conducting cumulative effects assessment. It has an optimization wizard uh, that works with MarkSan. And then from there, um, doing plan design and plan imp implementation and adaptive management. Another tool that we typically incorporate with land sea planning is some sort of a hydrologic model. Um, in the case of this project, we use something from NOAA called OpenNSpec that models our sedimentation, volume, and nutrient delivery to the shoreline. But then we need to extend uh, those sediments and pollutants into the marine realm. And so we um, can use a marine plume model. Um, Samantha will talk a bit more about that. But that's basically uh, some manual GIS uh, that was done. And that information then comes back into VISTA to be able to assess the impacts of those marine plumes under different scenarios. Some other tools that might be used uh, could include uh, land use planning and socioeconomic tools like community viz, um, sea level rise and marsh migration from SLAM view, and ecosystem services, a tool like INVEST. Next. So I'll just talk a little bit about our NatureServe VISTA tool. Um, we would consider it in the toolkit a framework integration tool, meaning that it performs a broad spectrum of functions in our planning process. And it also works well with other tools, so specialty tools uh, that, say, do hydrologic modeling. It can send information out to those tools to assist that modeling and then bring the results back in. Next. So um, our tagline there is conservation on the land, in the water, anywhere on the globe. So VISTA is a piece of software. It doesn't come preloaded with data. And it um, also can work um, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine. 
those panels in the middle are just indicating some of the breadth of applications that VISTA has been put to. Um, and of course, we're focused on coastal marine there on the right. Um, and then just um, acknowledging our funders across the bottom, um, over $4 million has been invested in the tool to date. And there is an endowment that allows us to keep it uh, supported over time. Next. And just a few basics. Um, so it is an extension to ArcMap. It's been in release since 2004 and again maintained uh, for current ESRI releases. Uh, it's a broadly capable tool, meaning that it's designed to help with a variety of different uh, conservation and planning and management activities in the land, air, and water. And it's also usable by people with different skill levels. You do need to have uh, people that have some fairly good skills with GIS, like with any GIS tool to get it set up. Um, and it is very much an expert knowledge driven tool, so you do need to have um, access to subject matter experts to populate the database. But from there, um, some of the basic functions, um, pretty much anybody can be taught to use those. So it can be usable by, uh, say, resource area managers and um, local government planners. And um, there is uh, full integrated help built into the tool as well as available tech support and training and assistance. So there have been over 2,000 downloads of it since uh, 2004. And, uh, we continue to get interest worldwide and in several new uh, downloads per week. Next. So just to walk through the analytical process of VISTA using some uh, thumbnails, here we begin with what we call conservation elements, also commonly known as targets. So these are the things that you're interested in assessing and representing on the landscape. And then there will be uh, values you can attach to those things, as well as the expert knowledge about their viability requirements and retention goals. Next. From there, you can combine those elements in a lot of different overlays and create what we call conservation value summaries. So those are going to examine patterns of value on the landscape, depending on the settings that you choose. Next. From there, we can characterize scenarios. And we can typically have a current actual baseline of what's going on in the land, air, and water, as well as then uh, looks at, say, what happens if uh, plans are built out as is, um, trends in terms of um, things like uh, invasive species and sea level and, and so on, um, and then alternative proposals, and finally, your new plan. And those scenarios include attributes both for what's physically going on as well as uh, the policy type or mechanism behind those things, which is designed to add um, another level of risk assessment in terms of the paper park problem, where we have areas designated for conservation but are not being reliably managed or enforced. So from there, VISTA integrates the elements with the scenarios and runs a couple different cumulative effects models. One is a simple categorical response of the elements to the scenario, such as negative, neutral, or beneficial response. The other is a, a gradient model um, where there's a scoring between 0 and 1. Um, on that gradient, um, whatever steps you would like. And then it also includes an off-site impact. So for example, you could have a shipping lane through your area and set a distance effect of, say, 1,000 meters out from that um, if it affects certain of your elements um, a certain distance. And those models can all be element-specific, so you can tailor it in a very custom way. So once those are combined, next we get a ser series of uh, maps and reports. And uh, Samantha will be showing more of these, so I won't spend a lot of time. But they're both uh, spatial maps as well as quantitative reports of how the elements fare under those scenarios. Next. And then we can drill down into different sites uh, within the landscape and seascape and see uh, what elements are there, how they're performing across the region, as well as within that site. And then we can see what the uh, contents of the scenario are within that site and how each feature of the scenario is either supporting or impacting our element. And uh, from there, we can turn this into a mitigation and design tool. So we can either do a single site mitigation, or we can use this tool to design an, an entirely new plan uh, by specifying both what we want to have happen on a site as well as what 
uh, implementation mechanism we want to use, such as um, uh, landowner education or policy or purchase and so on. Next. And so we also offer a um, wizard that helps to run Markzan. So you can, um, once you've built your Vista database, you have pretty much all of the data needed to run Markzan. And so Vista will package all that up for you, ask you a series of questions for things like boundary length modifiers. Um, and then it'll run Markzan. And then you can import the results back into Vista. You can assess the Marksan result as a scenario um, to identify any more uh, once you've run the more explicit ecological model in Vista, and then do more refined spatial design on that Marksan result as well as specify, uh, again, what you want to do on the site and the implementation mechanism for it. Next. You can also use Vista then for your ongoing plan implementation. It's designed to be very robust for new data in, inputs to it. So new element maps, um, new scientific information about how the elements respond to stress management interventions, um, new uh, proposals for land use or infrastructure or sea use. And so you can incorporate any of those at any time and refresh your analyses. And um, say if you lose a place on your plan you would want it for conservation, you can use the power of your database there to find the next available uh, location that can add to your plan. Next. Um, in terms of conservation elements, um, it's really, uh, go ahead and click next. Uh, this point about if you can map it and give it the basic requirements, you can include it. <clears throat> so you can see there's a, a list of things. These are all things that NatureServe has included in projects um, around the world, and so it's pretty flexible, um, including you can also use Vista as a multi-objective tool, and you can incorporate your desired land uses as elements within Vista, uh, and then Vista will uh, let you goal seek to represent those on the landscape while helping you avoid putting those in places that conflict with your other conservation elements. Next. So um, I mentioned the ongoing uh, implementation and adaptive management. So basically in seconds you can uh, select a site and select the proposed action for that site, whether it's um, a development activity, um, whether it's um, a restoration action, for example. And Vista will give you an immediate report on both the impacts and benefits of doing that on that site. Um, as I mentioned, if you lose a conservation priority area in your plan to another use, you can find the next available alternative um, to um, then incorporate in a new plan. And then you can, um, again, update your project with new and revised data and science. Next. OK. Right. From here, I'll turn it over to Samantha, who will go ahead and, and talk about the project and show us the demo. Thanks, Patrick. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of um, this project. It's a collaboration between NOAA and NatureServe. Um, NOAA has been working to identify marine protected areas and analyze existing MPAs. Um, and they're collecting information on coral reefs and other marine elements, as well as stressors. And their focus is mainly on rare and unique species. So this collaboration worked well with NatureServe because we've been working with the Conservation Trust in Puerto Rico for over 11 years. This has resulted in an extensive existing database for Puerto Rico. So NatureServe has, in the past, mostly focused on the terrestrial impacts in conservation. So with these two da databases combined, it provided a thorough base to begin the integrated land sea planning project. So this is our study area, um, the map shown here. And although NatureServe's modeled the entire terrestrial area of Puerto Rico, this project in particular focused on the Northeast Ecological Corridor, um, where NOAA has been collecting the marine data. So that's outlined in that bright green there and um, also shown as some of the existing uh, marine protected areas in that region. So just really quickly, um, we're going to be going through a lot of this with the live demo, but some of the um, methods to begin this project was first identifying these elements and stressors. So this is where Patrick was talking about working with that expert knowledge. And this is where we brought NOAA in 
to identify some of these elements and stressors for us. Um, the elements we worked with on the marine side were different densities of coral, uh, as well as sea turtle and manatee distributions. And um, we're just starting there just for demo purposes, uh, just those couple of different marine elements. For stressors, uh, we looked at the local effects of sedimentation, plumes of sedimentation, um, and some pollutants, nitrogen and phosphorus. Although, for again, for, um, for today's purposes, we'll just kind of be focusing on those sedimentation plumes. Those were modeled using NSPECT, which I'll kind of touch on a little bit later. Uh, we also got some information on fishing sites and ports and marinas. And so then we had to collect the land use land cover information and other current or future impacts. Um, for Again, for today's purposes, we'll just be focusing on current, but you could get into future using some sea level rise modeling. Um, we generated that current scenario, and then we have to evaluate this scenario based on how the elements are interacting with the landscape and interacting with the stressors. So this involves setting the retention goals for the species. And then you can review these evaluations. You can run several evaluations on a scenario um, and, and look over those and assess them. And, and this leads into running MarkSan, which um, utilizes the scenario evaluations to generate a cost system. Again, I'll be getting into more detail on this in the live demo. Um, and then we utilized Vista Site Explorer to get down and look at some really specific sites that MarkSan identified as important areas to see what was going on um, in those specific sites to those elements. And then that allows us to identify areas where land stresses are impacting the marine elements. And we can run alternative pollutant models using OpenInspect, bring those back into VISTA, and then rerun a new scenario and scenario evaluation. So OpenInspect um, is developed by NOAA. It allows us to um, model distributions of pollutants and sediments and then compare um, effects of different land use and land cover scenarios on those total yields. So um, like I said before, we use the sediment outputs and nitrogen just for uh, demonstration purposes, but there's lots of different outputs that you can get from NSPECT. And then to look at the plume modeling, um, I, I looked at some Maris imagery to see the formations of the plumes off the northeast coast of Puerto Rico. And uh, this is just one quick and easy way for me to um, model some of the accumulated sediment. So I used an, an accumulated sediment output from NSPECT um, and then modeled that out into the marine using uh, this imagery as my base. All right, so we'll get into some of the outputs then from our, uh, our VISTA project. So this first one here is called a Conservation Value Summary. Uh, it's a bit like a biodiversity hotspot map, and it's showing the richness of the elements. So I just want to show some of this distribution here. Um, on the marine side along the coast, we're seeing distribution of manatee and sea turtle, and then some of the smaller um, polygons here out in the marine side is distributions of the coral reefs. And the darker the color, it's the higher the conservation value. So this area that's very dark here is El Yinque National Forest. So it's a good example of a high, high conservation values in that location. And you can also see some high conservation values along the coastline. And as we'll see later, um, each output in VISTA comes with a report that details the contents of that output. So one thing I want to touch on before we get into the live demo is um, the response model and the landscape condition model. Um, so we're using right now, this is uh, our high density coral here as an example inside the element properties. Um, you, you select how that element responds to the stressors or the conservation impacts. So here we have um, under marine stressors, we have marine pollutants and then some suspended solid concentrations from those marine plumes. So very high concentrations and high concentrations and even medium, we rated that, uh, gave that a response of negative for coral. And then low is uh, neutral. So that's just one way that you can um, connect some of the, the land uh, stressors to the um, elements in your project. Another way is the landscape condition model, um, which 
allows you to give a site intensity value from 0 to 1 that rates the condition of the element from theoretically perfect, which is 1, to a condition of 0 uh, for each individual stressor or conservation impact. So again, here under um, high density coral and marine pollutants, we gave an intensity value to different concentrations of the marine plumes. And then you can also, um, as Patrick was talking about before with shipping lanes as an example, you can use um, distance to factor in. Uh, so distance out might still be impacting those elements. And the scenario evaluation needs these responses um, in order to run. So um, again, I'll, I'll just remind us when we get to that point that this response model went into um, our scenario evaluation. All right, so what we're going to be doing in our live demo is first looking at the results from our current scenario, and then um, we're going to look at how we evaluated that scenario, and then from there, how we incorporated Marksan, and then finally using Vista's Site Explorer to look at some of the specific sites. Okay, so here in um, ArcMap, you have your typical table of contents here, but what VISTA gives you is its own table of contents with your project set up here, as well as right here is our VISTA toolbar. So first we're, um, we're going to look at the current scenario, which is listed right here. And um, the, the di there's different layers that uh, result from that current scenario. So in integrated land sea planning, we're accounting for direct stressors on the land and sea, as well as land-based stressors that are indirect. So VISTA can handle all of this information at the same time, since it's in a, it is a cumulative effects assessment tool. So we can just turn on some of these layers here and see um, that there's different impacts happening at a certain site. So right here, we're seeing some of the, um, what looks like the local sediment effects, and out in the water, this tan area looks to be the, the plume modeling. And then this layer here, turn off the sediment, we're seeing the land use um, and uh, land use and, um, and, and some of the red here showing some of the urban areas that might also be uh, happening at the same site as maybe some high uh, local sediment effects. Anything else you want to touch on, Patrick, with the current scenario? Uh, no, I think that's fine. Okay. Thanks. All right, so after we've generated this current scenario, we need to evaluate it. And we'll open up first the report from that scenario evaluation. Um, and it's, it's hierarchical, hierarchical here, um, and I'm not sure how well you um, you can read this, but I'll just let you know what some of this is in the report. Uh, it starts with the settings that went into the report down to the performance. Um, and here, the small number is 96.77% uh, of our goals are unmet. So we're not meeting a lot of our goals um, in this current scenario evaluation. And we keep scrolling down. We'll get to the specific elements that are making up this scenario evaluation. Um, Starting on the, the left here are the, um, are the elements and then their distribution area, their current distribution area, as well as their average condition. And we set a goal to protect 100% of those elements. And then here, this little red light, yellow light, and there's one green light down here, is just quick telling you, did we meet those goals? Um, so a lot of it's no. And what's left here in this next column tells you the viable areas um, and then that condition. And this final column is the percent of the goal that was met. So for a lot of these elements, where we are not meeting the goals um, in our current scenario evaluation. Anything else there, Patrick, you want to chime in on? Uh, no, that's fine. And there's a lot more detail to this, if, uh, which we won't do, but if you were to click on one of those hyperlinked element names, that'll take you to a much more detailed report of uh, how that element is performing in terms of its uh, compatibility and viability. There's 
a couple dozen different charts and statistics that it provides. And all of these um, reports you can export uh, to HTML for websites or incorporate in a Word document and so on. Great. So the next thing we'll get into here is um, under our marine uh, evaluation that we ran, we have all these different outputs from that scenario evaluation. So this first one here is our viability conflict. And uh, this output draws our attention to um, problem areas. So tan areas, uh, there is no conflict happening at that site. But then it shades from pink to red, um, and which corresponds to the increasing number of elements in that location that are not viable. So we can see here, just really quickly, that a lot of our elements fell way short of our goals. And we want to create a plan to address these problems. So this is where we bring in MarkSAM. So I'll click on um, one of our MarkSAN outputs here. Did you want to show the condition model too? Um, the cost surface? Yeah, I'm going to get into that next. OK. Um, So as Peter talked about before, there is a MarkSan wizard in Vista that allows for um, interoperability between the two programs. And um, just really quickly, MarkSan is an optimization tool that shows us efficiently where to work. So the areas in green are highlighting locations that this particular run of MarkSan shows as ideal places for us to work. And MarkSan runs thousands of iterations, and there are multiple outputs from that. But for time's sake, we're just showing um, this particular run. So MarkSan uh, needs a, a cost input in order to best determine which sites to select. And again, there's many ways to generate that cost. Um, we did this by using Vista's scenario evaluation condition model outputs. So I'm just going to go back to our Vista tab here. As Patrick was mentioning, there's these condition models, one for the marine side and one for the terrestrial side. The green is showing um, good condition, and as the color scale moves towards red, it's showing poor conditions. So that's the one for marine. I'll just quickly show terrestrial as well. So um, the way we use this for cost is that areas with poor condition are receiving a higher cost in MarkSAM. And then another thing we did in that particular run was um, what's called a site selection. So we can select sites to lock in um, to MarkSan, and we utilize this feature to select sites with high local sediment effects. So let me just turn those on. So this is the one of the inspect outputs um, of high local sediment effects. And uh, we, we locked in some sites with, that had high um, local sediment as their sources of um, potential indirect threats to our marine elements. And um, we want to see an area right here, actually. We'll zoom in a little bit. There's an area where we can see a dark red, so there's high local sediment effects near a major river. Um, and we know this um, is actually an area of concern, so we're going to kind of focus in on this particular area here now. Go back to our... So we saw impacts earlier in this area with that viability conflict layer, and we also saw that MarkSan selected this area in green. So we want to assess further what's being impacted, and to do that, we're just going to focus on one element, which is our manatee, um, and look at that element viability and condition. So in this first one, it's the um, just the element viability for the manatee. Um, with areas in red is not viable and blue is viable. And just to point out quickly, this difference here where we see some viability right at the mouth of the river, just that just comes from a difference in the coastline when we were modeling the, um, doing the plume modeling using the, the Maris imagery. So um, that's the viability uh, output there. And then we can look at the condition of that element. So um, again, same thing as before. The color scale went, went, is going from green um, to red here with that orange and red areas is very poor conditions. Um, and we want to uh, mitigate this problem. 
Is there anything else you want to mention here, Patrick, before we get into Site Explorer? Uh, no, I mean just you know recapping the storyline. Basically, the, this idea we can see that we've got an element we care about. It's non-viable. We can look at the condition to get that more nuanced view of where it's in uh, better condition versus worse condition. And now the next step with Site Explorer is for us to be able to drill down through and see really exactly what's going on there. Um, and I just want to make a note. We, we just used an equal area grid here. Uh, with Site Explorer, we could really use any polygon layer we want. So we might want to, say, create a hybrid layer that is uh, a a grid with MPAs and, and um, other managed areas in the marine area. And then uh, on the land, maybe we use watersheds. Um, we could also have private property boundaries and manage management units and so on. So it's pretty flexible that way. OK, so, um, so I'm going to select these four grids here out in the marine area. Just wait for that to populate up in our Site Explorer menu. OK, so what we're seeing here, um, this, these are the two elements that are occurring in this site that I selected. We have a coral and manatee happening here. And there's lots of different uh, fields that you can add to the Site Explorer. But um, just for simplicity's sake today, we're going to be just kind of focusing on this compatible area field here. So um, in manatee, when we just kind of mouse over, we see that uh, at this particular site, there is no compatible area, and it's all incompatible for the manatee. So we, um, we want to figure out why this is happening. And we can do this um, by, again, right inside the Site Explorer, seeing what um, the scenario composition is at this site. All right, so what we're seeing here are two different plumes. There is nitrogen and then sediment. And uh, there's very high nitrogen and very high sediment plumes happening at this site. And then up here, what kind of popped up in the side here when I clicked on this was the response of that element. So it's responding negative to um, very high sediment plumes. So this allows us to kind of start connecting this, this storyline and figuring out what's happening here. Um, if there were other. Uh, impacts, there are other parts of the scenario, for example, maybe some direct marine stressors, such as fishing sites or um, something else happening. This would all, that would also pop up here, and we could actually utilize this override feature um, to override those marine stressors um, and see what a different policy type might impact. So we could make um, we could, we could remove that threat. We could make this area a marine protected area um, and see how that would impact back up here, the compatible area happening for um, whatever elements are occurring in that site. But we don't have that happening. Just, oh, go ahead. Just another quick mention there is that earlier in the presentation, I talked about VISTA as a multi-objective tool. So if we also had, uh, say, a, a socioeconomic element like uh, artisanal fishing grounds in that site, um, we might also then, by proposing, say, a strict MPAC, that we might be impacting that. And so again, this is a tool that allows you to do a lot of what if playing around and understand um, both the pros and cons of different actions that you might take. All right. So. Um... So since this is an indirect threat, in this case, we're getting a sediment plume, we want to kind of trace up this watershed and look for areas where um, that, that could be adding to this accumulation of sediment. So I'm actually going to just, to demonstrate this process, turn on that sediment effects layer again. Just wait while ArcGIS loads everything. All right. So tracing back up the watershed here, um, this area right here, we're seeing a lot of high local sediment. And that's most likely leading to some accumulated sediment going down the river and out into the marine side. So again, we can take our site explorer and just select those sites there. 
And that will populate again here, this time with our terrestrial elements showing. There's a lot more terrestrial elements occurring at this site. And again, compatible areas, we're seeing a lot of um, incompatible um, uh, area at this site for some of these terrestrial um, elements. And then down in the scenario composition, there's a lot more happening here. So we're seeing some highways, major roads, so there's some direct terrestrial threats. Let's scroll down and try to find some of that, um, some of those potential threats that could also be impacting the marine. So for example, there it is, sediment. Click on that. This is a very high um, range for local sediment here. And you can see it's also impacting the terrestrial elements um, negatively. So it's impacting the terrestrial elements and then um, leading to accumulation that's impacting our marine elements. So um, we found this connection and, and we've ad addressed this problem, but now we want to um, see if we can form some alternative scenarios that would solve this. So what we actually do next is um, go back into Inspect and try to change this local high sediment effects. This is actually the polygon I used um, inside of Inspect to, um, to change the land cover. So I just drew a quick polygon. This area is actually a lot of agriculture. I drew a quick polygon around that back in Inspect and just change the land cover from agriculture to mixed forest to see how that would um, impact the, uh, the local high sediment effects. So I have that layer here, I'll show you. So this is what was currently happening. And then this is what happened when I changed that. So that big area right there that we saw, that high sedimentation um, has now kind of faded and it's not so high uh, local sediment effects. That went back into our plumes. So I'm going to turn those on quickly here. This is the original plume um, with the darker colors and these values, this really high value here um, is this area and then it kind of get, fades away as we get further from the shoreline. And then the new one, not too much change of color, but the value is um, much lower. Once I um, change the amount of, there actually is an accumulated sediment layer that you get from Inspect. Once I incorporated that into my plume modeling, um, I got a much lower value out in the marine side here. So what we do next is um, we take these layers, we put them into a new scenario, um, a mitigation scenario. And then we rerun the evaluations on that um, and see if we've solved that problem. So when we go back into Site Explorer, we can then click on those same sites I selected earlier and see if we've resolved those problems um, of the impacts on, for example, we were looking at the manatee. So see the impacts that, um, that happened on the manatee there. Anything else you want to touch on here, Patrick, and the VISTA project? Uh, no, I think that's good. You, people, I think, get the idea that this is um, a very iterative process. So even though we're incorporating MarkSan to help guide uh, some of the direction of the work, when it comes down to really doing the much more refined uh, site-level decision-making, it can be very iterative, and, and VISTA allows you to test a lot of those what-ifs um, very easily. And I guess one other thing I'd mentioned is um, in terms of um, the MarkSan output, uh, you had mentioned locking in a lot of these areas of high uh, erosion, essentially generating a lot of that sediment in MarkSan to, to um, identify those essentially as important places that could contribute. Uh, there might be other ways that people can uh, get at that issue. So one of the things that uh, we're also experimenting with is um, adding those areas to the cost surface in a way that would actually um, show them lower cost to attract those to be part of the MarkSan solution. So I think depending on what people's uh, situations are where they're working, uh, there's some different creative ways to uh, combining the data and the outputs among these tools uh, to help guide your work. All right.
Um, so let me just go through some conclusions and then we'll get to questions. Um, so uh, basically the idea of this, um, tr this workflow that I showed earlier is meant to guide the logical application and integration of a tool kit. And so the tools are supporting the workflow. And also, again, the toolkit can be configured for particular issues of an area, different capacities, different data situations, and so on. Um, Samantha, as um, our intern last year, demonstrated that it is feasible for one person to actually learn and operate this core toolkit. Um, but most appropriately, we'd actually think about a collaboration among the organizations across these different realms different sectors and so on, where they're each operating their relevant tools. So for example, the people working on land use planning would operate a land use planning tool like Community Viz, um, and then they would feed their alternatives into, uh, say, the people that are working on marine conservation, and then they could iterate uh, the use of these tools back and forth. Um, and then again, the toolkit can be used in this ongoing plan implementation and adaptive management. Next. So uh, we'll be happy to take some questions. And I just wanted to indicate here there are some follow-up opportunities. Um, through the EBM Tools program, you can arrange training um, on the toolkit. Uh, there's some emails uh, there for Samantha and I if you'd like to do any personal follow-ups. Um, and then um, you can get at Vista. Basically, you can just go to natureserve.org slash Vista. Um, if you'd like to go uh, look more specifically at that tool. Um, there is also an older, but I think still relevant, um, technical guide that was developed on our first pilot several years ago of operating several of these tools together. Um, so you can uh, in, look up uh, integrated land sea planning and nature serve, and you should be able to come across uh, that technical guide. And they just wanted to credit some other folks, Dan Dorfman and Cameron Scott, who helped out with some of the technical work. And I think we'll go ahead and wrap up there and see if we have some questions. OK, thank you. And, and I'd also encourage people to send in more questions. Uh, you can do so by typing the questions into the question panel of the user interface or raising your virtual hand and I'll unmute you. OK, so uh, we have several questions already. Um, one is, have you tried to link inspect to a regional, well, actually, that's sort of focused on inspect, so we'll wait on that one. Um, is, re is resolution enough to work on keys and small islands, uh, such as within the Arrecifes de Cordillera Nature Reserve? Uh, yeah, these tools, um, for the most part, are all scale free. So it all depends on uh, if the scale of the data you have available supports, um, A, characterizing the features and stressors that you need to deal with, and um, if that scale is appropriate to the management questions um, you're answering. And we also like to think about scales in terms of there's a, uh, a planning scale and then there's uh, more of that, say, regulatory level of implementation that requires a lot more uh, precision and confidence. But the tools themselves are, are all scale free um, and you can work really at any scale that is appropriate to those issues. OK, great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, there's a question. Is it possible to integrate local knowledge into the tool? Um, absolutely. Local knowledge comes in um, in a number of ways, of course, starting with scoping. Um, so you know, what are the conservation elements of interest? What are the stressors? Um, thinking through about um, future scenarios, what sort of things should be captured in future scenarios. Um, and then there are also values, so the elements, we didn't show this, but the elements can be assigned um, community values, um, for example, and then um, the expert knowledge in terms of um, how the elements respond to things that can show up in the scenario, so both stressors but as well as um, uh, beneficial management and conservation practices. So all of those things in VISTA can um, draw on that local knowledge. Um, some of the other tools, uh, you know, there's uh, probably some opportunities to help parameterize those. So for example, um, uh, rates of infiltration of different soil types, you know, might be something that local knowledge could contribute to in a tool like Inspect. OK, great. Thank you. 
Um, another question, and this has to do with the, the um, example of the manatee and sea turtles. Uh, where can we find the references used for manatee and sea turtle distribution, and were sea turtle nesting beaches included in the model? I'll turn that one over to Samantha. Yeah, um, those came as um, points that basically um, just did some manual GIS to do the, the distributions on that. We do have some better manatee distribution layers we've since um, acquired, but those haven't been worked into the project yet. We were just kind of showing some of the, um, just the quick examples in the demo today. So no um, sea turtle nesting beaches were not included in this particular example. Um, I believe NOAA does or is collecting information on, on those sites. So that's definitely, those are definitely things we can include in a project like this um, as we continue to develop it. Okay, great. Um, let's see, and there was a question early on in, in the webinar as we got started, and that was someone who was curious how integrated landscape planning is different from integrated watershed management or landscape conservation design and other terms um, for a landscape approach. Is it something new or is it sort of using the same conservation planning landscape approach? Uh, well, I think the um, all of these things um, actually nest under ecosystem-based management, and we coined this term for integrated land sea planning um, just to indicate that we're trying to do something uh, that probably could fit under, um, say, landscape conservation design, but we're very, being very explicit in this that we are addressing marine and terrestrial conservation simultaneously. Um, a lot of times when uh, people talk about this sort of issue between terrestrial and marine, what they're really talking about is marine conservation, but being cognizant about land-based stressors. We obviously did that um, quite explicitly, but what we also addressed, and again, we didn't have time to show all of the nuance here, um, but we addressed benefits to terrestrial conservation as well. So when Samantha brought up um, the idea of um, in Site Explorer, we wanted to look at an area that was contributing sedimentation and nutrients. Um, we also were looking at places that have high terrestrial biodiversity that are also impacted by land uses and erosion. And so the, the point being that we feel like there's a lot more um, efficiency and leverage and a lot more ex explicit trade-offs that can be made if we're actually taking this dual position um, in terms of both terrestrial and marine conservation at the same time and dealing with the direct and indirect stressors at the same time. Okay. All right. Thank you, Patrick. All right. I'm going to try and uh, sort of parse this one, this question out a little. It has to do with the toolkit. Um, have you tried to link INSPECT to a regional planning or socioeconomic uh, scenario model uh, so that there's a human systems driver like sort of above INSPECT in, in the toolkit? Um, and so the, I think they're there's speculating that this would make a user-friendly decision support interface for policymakers and legislators regula and re regulators. Yeah, I'm sorry, we don't have a representative uh, from NOAA to talk more explicitly about NSPECT. Um, maybe we could get them on for another uh, EBM Tools webinar uh, later. Um, I can say that the in terms of socioeconomics, and, and just maybe guessing a bit behind the question, um, that it, it can also function in a toolkit mode. So for example, it does not have an urban growth model, but you could have an urban growth model or just another model of landscape change. Um, it might say look at change um, of fallow lands into agriculture because of economic uh, policy, for example. And so uh, results of those kind of models could come into NSPEC to then forecast changes in runoff and sedimentation and, and pollution. Uh, from socioeconomic changes happening on the landscape. Okay. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and can you talk about who um, has used the or or is using the integrated land sea planning toolkit? Is it mostly NGOs or are community land use planners also taking advantage of the toolkit as well? Um, yeah. I mean, we we've applied the toolkit um, 
in basically on, on all the U.S. coasts, on the, the 48 states, and then here in Puerto Rico most recently. Um, and so essentially the, um, you know, we applied the toolkit and then different components of that toolkit, I think, really, you know, get handed off to, uh, you know, the different organizations or agencies that represent that aspect. Um, so if it's uh, primarily a, you know, conservation, it would be, um, you know, VISTA would go to those conservation organizations or conservation agencies or, or wildlife management agencies, um, whereas NSPECT might be operated more by the land use planners and or uh, watershed uh, managers, um, uh, you know, different programs about like coastal zone management would be, say, more interested in a tool like uh, NSPECT. Um, and then um, it, from there, the other more specific tools that we didn't show but mentioned, like um, community viz for land use planning, obviously would be those land use planning entities. Okay, all right. Thanks, Patrick. And another question: Has anyone used the Vista toolkit for red plus uh, forest carbon model uh, accounting? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, again, we've had a couple thousand downloads of Vista worldwide, and and um, last we surveyed was 2014 for what people were using it for, and it was it was a huge long list. So I am not recalling offhand. Uh, we did uh, get some inquiries about how Vista can support that, and we we did uh, uh, you know separate. Um, webinar for some folks interested in that, so I would just encourage uh, whoever's asking that question, you can email me uh, specifically and uh, I could have an offline uh, conversation with you about that. Okay, great. Um, okay, one last question just rolled in. Um, sort of general, uh, how does INVEST fit into this toolkit? Yeah, I'll say we haven't used INVEST um, ourselves yet, so uh, the way we've thought about it is um, first uh, INVEST um, requires scenarios to be able to model, and one of the strengths in VISTA is actually um, compiling data and integrating it from a lot of disparate sources into a wall-to-wall -wall scenario, uh, and again, both land and sea, so VISTA could be used at the front end um, to generate that scenario. Um, and then once the um, ecosystem services modeling is done in INVEST, you could import those um, ecosystem services outputs as elements in VISTA and then do threat assessment against those. Now VISTA is not going to do the uh, monetary re-evaluation of those much like um, VISTA could not recalculate sediment outputs under a new land use scenario. That's where you would feed that back to those more specific models. So basically, you know, in uh, VISTA we could do threat assessment against those um, ecosystem services, uh, come up with a new alternative scenario to try to mitigate some of those stressors on the ecosystem services put that scenario back into INVEST, remodel again to see, you know, if we're getting the kind of ecosystem service values we were hoping to get. So VISTA basically acting front end in terms of uh, scenario characterization and then acting as that planning tool to actually develop the planned scenario that provides the level of ecosystem services desired. Okay, thank you, Patrick, and we had a comment saying, superb presentation, many thanks, uh, and I'd like to echo those thanks. Uh, so much to Patrick and Samantha for coming and presenting today. It was, it was uh, incredibly interesting to learn about this toolkit and um, what can be done with it. Um, and we hope to, and we'd, I'd like to thank everyone who was able to attend today. We hope to have you back on future webinars as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay, and have a have a great afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. Okay, all right, bye everyone.